at a little bit and you'll be able to see the link to the survey. It's really, really quick. Um, oh, thank you for starting the recording. I appreciate you guys for doing that for me. Um, Nearly six to eight years ago, the concept of doulas working with home visitors came to my attention in particular as a passion project for a former home visitor, right? Some of you may know who she is. Years later, that concept was revisited as a solution to scary, scary statistics about death and near-death experiences of a population of women that we serve, in particular women of color, right? So home visiting programs throughout the network in the meantime and between time figured out how to add this invaluable service of doula support to the panel of offerings to their families. And I just want those on the line who are um, a, who were able to add doula services to their current um, constellation of programs to know that this service is also welcome to you. I just want you to be mindful of your partners in the network. So since you have some of those services already um, available to you, just, just be mindful of our friends, right? The OEC wrote a doula support, um, the OEC wrote a doula support pilot into the Supporting Pregnant and Parenting Teams program a couple of years ago. Um, and then as a result of that, uh, the success of that small pilot program, we were able to further write um, or, or to ask um, the project and the pilot to be, uh, to be refunded through another line of support. So our uh, PDG funding was able to bring forth this pilot, this new version of, of the doula project. And so I'm excited to be able to share with you guys today. And I think we, we highlighted a little bit in the opening orientation that we're going to be developing through these funds, a statewide network of doulas, including training and adding new doulas to the workforce, right? With the goal of supporting the birth of a hundred babies throughout the network. So super excited that through this doula project will um, serve 100 babies. But when you count the babies that are going to be served through the network, um, it's it's going to be even greater than that. So it's 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 exciting. Um, so today you're going to hear from our lead agency who will coordinate the training um, and matching of families and our lead research uh, associate from UConn. I'm excited that we are gonna be able to collect some data from this experience that the families have, home visitors have, the doulas have, um, to be able to support uh, the ask of further funding for this project. So uh, we're gonna hear from a research associate from UConn to talk about how she's going to approach that in the ask that she'll have from you guys. So by way of agenda, welcome. I'm glad everyone was able to put their name and agency in the chat so we know who's in the building. We are over 110 strong, so I'm excited that so many people are uh, here and logged on and able to hear about this project, right? Um, next, drawing your attention again to those who are just entering. Uh, further up in the chat, there's a link to a pre-survey um, for this session. So if you have yet to do that, please um, click that link and answer those five questions really quickly uh, as, as we uh, continue the introductions of who is going to be speaking to us today. And so uh, next up, we're going to have Earth's Natural Touch presentation. Um, so it's kind of like a doula 101 coupled with the layout and the rollout in the, of how we're going to implement the, the doula project. Uh, from the OEC's perspective. And then we're going to have a brief overview of uh, the Yukon evaluation. The link isn't working for you guys. Any any um, feedback? I know Molly's on the line right now. And so Molly, is there any breakdown in the link? Um, and I can't see because I'm sharing. And so if Molly, you're on the line and you can copy a fresh uh, link for us and throw yeah, it in there. Uh, yeah, I'll put a new one on and see if it works better. Thanks. Okay, so um, Molly is our lead research associate from UConn and developed the um, the link. And so I may have copied it too many times and it got 
kind of lost in, in its purity. And so Molly's going to be working on that for us. Had to move to Google Chrome to open it on her end. So that is something that has been shared. So if people have access to Google Chrome and copy the link and paste it there, then um, Sandra was uh, successful in completing that. And so then we'll have um, a question and answer session, and then we'll get you on your way. And so I want to um, introduce our first speakers uh, or representatives from um, Earth's Natural. Oh, thank you. See, and I look so much better. I don't even know if mine looked that good. Um, from Earth's Natural Touch. And so I want to introduce the, the leads of that agency. And I think Cynthia is on the line and will probably be shepherding us through this uh, PowerPoint presentation. Cynthia, I see you on there and I'll be uh, here to support the clicking along of your presentation. So you can just say next slide and I'll move you along. So by way of introduction, I want to um, read some quick bios on um, the, the two leads of our lead doula uh, organization who is going to be supporting that training and the matching, right? So first up, we have Sayana Devotion. She began this journey when she trained as a birth doula in 2001, establishing Earth's Natural Touch, Birth Care, and Beyond, which is now the largest Black-owned doula training organization and collective in New England and has trained inter interdisciplinary doulas across the country since 2016 using an equity framework. Over the years, she continued to advance in the field of reproductive health and certified as um, a childbirth educator, postpartum doula, maternal child health specialist, and certified lactation counselor, to name a few. She has supported um, birth in a variety of environments, from hospital to birth center to home settings, and is currently a student as a midwife. Um, Cynthia Hayes has a BS in business management and has been employed with the state of Connecticut for 27 years. Cynthia has been a postpartum doula for 17 years and is now proud to be a part of Earth's Natural Touch, Birth Care and Beyond, where she trained and became a certified interdisciplinary doula. She is a certified lactation counselor, maternal child health specialist, and is also a member of the Connecticut chapter of Postpartum Support International. They have both received specialized training to support families experience, experiencing perinatal mood and anxiety disorders and also work as bereavement doulas for families experiencing a loss. They are members of the Doulas for Connecticut Coalition and have been doing legislative work here in Connecticut, which you will hear a little bit more about during the presentation. So I'm super, I gotta say excited. How many times did anybody tick that? Cause I think I said excited like 15 times today. I need a new word, um, but it's it's how I feel. Um, we've been waiting for this for a very long time. And so I'm excited to be able to roll out this pilot um, and support that um, effort um, that has been a long time coming which is a song that's been in my spirit for a long time. And so um, I think we're going to have Cynthia, correct? If hey you can, everyone, um, this is Sayana. We're both going to oh, present. You, oh, you both are there. Okay, great, great, yes. great. Okay. So is it okay if I manage your slides or do you want to share That's and take fine. control? Yeah, okay. you can manage them. Okay, so I'll mute myself and turn the camera off and I will stop talking as the show is about to begin. Um, so I welcome you, Sayana and Cynthia, to um, to the home visiting crew. So um, welcome crew. and I'll stop talking. Thank you for having us. I just want to make sure Cynthia can unmute. Cynthia, are you there? Are you able to speak? She sent me a text and said that she couldn't unmute. So I don't know if maybe the participants are not able to. Let me see. She should have... Uh the ability to, if anything, um, Sayana, if you keep going and then Cynthia may have to log out okay, and then click the link again. And then That's sometimes actually what I, I had to do. Um, but so I was like waiting in the waiting oh, room. Okay. Like, Let me try this again. Okay, so well, maybe that might help her. So Cynthia, if you need to log out and log back in. Okay. So um, welcome, everybody. This is um, all about Earth's Natural Touch Birth Can Beyond's Doula Skills Beyond the Basics program for agencies and organizations. Um, and we are happy to be here with you all. We want to 
tell you all about some of the things that we're doing, why we're doing it, and what our goals and plans are um, when it comes to working with you and your agencies. Okay, next slide. So Earth's Natural Touch, Birth Can Beyond are doulas and perinatal health advocates who work to reduce the risk of undesirable pregnancy and birth outcomes. We're all about promoting perinatal wellness for parents and children and supporting breastfeeding families to all families. And um, we want to work to reduce and eliminate racial and ethnic disparities in infant and maternal health within undervalued, underrepresented, and historically excluded communities. So, you know, the concept of doulas, a lot of people are wondering, where did this come from? Throughout history and across many cultures, there's a long history of women who specialized in supporting during childbirth. Young women grew up learning and seeing and interacting with the community midwives. And we learned from other women the process of labor, birth, and breastfeeding and childcare. One of the most memorable events in a person's life is the birth of their child. Historically, parents were surrounded by women who provided support during that most precious time. And now being a doula is a paid profession. So doulas are now trained childbirth postpartum professionals um, that provide emotional, physical, informational, and even logistical support to partners and, their, and, and the parents during labor, delivery, and the postpartum period. There are also doulas who focus specifically on other areas of reproduction. So you may see fertility doulas and adoption doulas and bereavement doulas. And sometimes they're not even called doulas. They may be called birth sister or birth keeper or birth coach or birth companion. Um, but, you know, most people are becoming more familiar with the term doula. So that's what we're going to use. So what do doulas do? Professional birth doulas provide continuous labor support using complex emotional support skills that differ from what obstetric nurses or midwives provide, which may explain positive obstetric and neonatal birth outcomes that are seen when doulas are present at births. Studies show that the best birth outcomes are seen when a person's continuous birth support person is not a family member, not a part of their social network, and not a hospital employee. Doulas are those extra eyes, ears, and hands, and they can be responsive to things and bring awareness to things that are outside of the range of normal that may require some extra care. So doulas also work to make sure that the family is well adjusted, the parent's perinatal mood is good, and that the mother and baby are eating and recovering well together with nothing alarming happening, right? So doulas can also help to reinforce positive parenting skills and care strategies for everyone. So I just wanna bring your attention really quickly the picture on the left is a bunch of doulas that got together and were preparing like nutritious foods. Um, and it's a game we actually, if you're familiar with the show Chopped, that's what we did, but we did the doula version um, and it was a lot of fun. In other words, you know, you can help a family come up with some nutritious meals with some of the basic things that they have. Um, we actually just made them. But on the right, there is a graph that shows you um, the time of maternal death and why postpartum care is so important. And if you can see, about 30% of maternal deaths happen before the birth, about 17% happen the day of the birth, and the rest happen after the birth up until 365 days. That's all considered maternal mortality up to a year after birth. And that's why um, it's really important to have that postpartum support and care. Bereavement doulas provide physical, emotional, and informational support to families who are experiencing pregnancy loss, possibly one of the most difficult times in their lives. And these parents often still require physical support. They will need to recover from their physical loss and also the mental strain. So how are doulas getting trained? Professional doulas are non-medical support persons who may have formal training from a professional organization. Some may even have nursing or midwifery education and experience or aspire to do so. However, many have not had any healthcare training at all. 
Currently, although doulas are generally unregulated, there are close to 90 known doula training organizations across the United States, and each of them have their own unique personalities and specialties, with most having core com competencies commonality. Why is our training so long? So a typical doula training is about three to four days, but we know that just after three to four days of training, it can be challenging to navigate all of the complexities that often come with supporting families in undervalued, underrepresented, and historically ignored communities who are living with the weight of historical and generational traumas while navigating institutional racism and all of the social determinants of health, which can all influence their reproductive choices, options, and outcomes. Most doula trainings in the country have used a white framework, which does not just does not work for our communities. Um, our program encompasses a white a wide range of knowledge from conception through the birth and postpartum, and many things in between, such as nutrition, loss, intimate partner violence, trauma responsiveness, um, breastfeeding, and much much more through several training units. Overall, the training prepares our doulas to support families in many environments and through a wide range of circumstances, encompassing the full spectrum expectation and beyond to becoming an Earth's Natural Touch ANO doula. So full spectrum is basically doulas who deal with um, all kinds of pregnancy and whatever choices those families make, we kind of go even beyond that and include the bereavement um, portion as well as trauma and things like that. Doulas often connect families with resources, and I know as home visitors, you all are doing the same thing, right? Because these families may need help, you know, with their needs, like navigating housing issues or food insecurity, clothing assistance, transportation. This assistance can help to reduce the social stressors that a birth in person may be experiencing due to their race, sex, or socioeconomic status. These issues disproportionately impact low-income people of color. Doulas can help families who face discrimination and often feel disempowered within the complex healthcare system to navigate that system. Doulas can help to mediate the effects of institutional biases within healthcare systems. Many community doulas chose to become doulas specifically to take on the role of providing culturally relevant support to birthing people. So how do doulas impact birth outcomes? So I tell you know my, my students all the time, like being a doula is not just about rubbing backs and holding hands, right? You all just heard, like we're also helping people navigate systems. We're also helping to connect them to resources and things like that. But doulas, although we're not medical professionals, we do have um, an effect on birth outcomes. So clients will, you know, on average, typically have shorter length of labor, decreased use of oxytocin and augmentation drugs, less vacuum and forceps are used. Um, their babies are born with higher APGAR scores, which is a scoring system for newborns to see how healthy and well they're doing. Increased and near universal breastfeeding initiation, a earlier onset of lactogenesis, that's when the milk lets down, um, increased breastfeeding length, lower rates of cesarean sections, lower incidence of low birth weight and preterm birth, less pain and anxiety, less use of pain medications such as epidurals and increased birth experience satisfaction. And of course, all of those things can result in a huge re reduction in medical costs. So Dr. David Williams, PhD is a Harvard professor and he says this, Basically, what we have found is that discrimination is a type of stressful life experience that has negative effects on health, similar to other kinds of stressful experiences. We now know that discrimination is linked to higher blood pressure, to high levels of inflammation, to low infant birth weight. Discrimination predicts higher levels of mortality, and people who experience it are literally more likely to die. And so on this slide, I just want to take a minute and just, you know, kind of look at it. There's a whole bunch of things up here. Um, but I want to talk to you about weathering. 
And weathering is a concept of the wear and tear on our bodies. Some of you may have heard this. This may be a new concept for you. But it basically means that our engines are always running. And having our engines always running is not only impacting us, but it also has a laughing, lasting impact on generations to come, right? These are just some concerns that Black women and people of color in general may have that most white people are not necessarily experiencing. For example, I can tell you that after Trayvon Martin was killed, Black parents everywhere talked to their sons about wearing uh, their hoods outside. And I can't see you all, um, but Usually I'm seeing people nodding their heads like, absolutely, we had those conversations or yes, my sister had to talk to my nephew about that, you know, and things like that. But the same conversations um, that were drenched in fear did not necessarily happen in white households. My own son one day, um, he came home from college on a break and he was out hanging out with his friends innocently. He walks through the door about eight o'clock. It was dark outside and he had his hood on his head. And when I saw him, I froze with fear. Um, and when we are rushing to get, you know, th this is the type of uh, the, the feelings that we have on a regular basis, right? Or when we're running to get somewhere, we don't think about getting pulled over and just, you know, getting a ticket. We're thinking about being pulled over, being harassed, possibly being killed um, over, you know, maybe going five miles over the speed limit. And even when we think we are ignoring the urban hassles, which are mentioned down at the bottom, um, as Dr. Joy DeGroy calls them, such as police sirens and gunshots on ambulance, we're not, we think that we're not unaffected, but the body is keeping the score, right? And so the stress hormones that we have in our systems are constantly running. And so this is why uh, there's a concept of weathering and how it affects um, black women in particular because of the stress. And um, we know that stress can negatively impact birth outcomes. We even fear ourselves, uh, like being ourselves, right? And wearing our hair as it naturally grows out of our head. We're concerned about being discriminated against in the workplace. If white people are uncomfortable with our hairstyles or our tone or even our passion that they may misinterpret as threatening aggression. And in the hospital spaces, we know that we are treated differently if we don't have private insurance um, and may live in certain neighborhoods. So our engines are constantly running, um, which can you know, have an impact on our health and the health of our babies. Next slide. So doulas help to reduce some stress, right? Having a doula who provides psychosocial support can help to reduce maternal stress, which in turn has a positive influence on pregnancy and birth outcomes. Therefore, the inequities in pregnancy outcomes for Black and low-income women can be addressed by increasing access to doula support, which is why we are here today. But there are barriers, right? So there aren't many programs like this. There are lack of information about doula services for parents, communities, and medical providers, lack of available services. So there are an insufficient number of doulas of color. Most doulas are white, upper class, well-educated, and married. And there are certainly not enough doulas for everyone who may want one. The cost of services can be a barrier because most insurance companies don't cover the cost of doula support. Um, even though it has been shown that doulas can um, have a huge impact on um, medical costs. Many parents can't afford to pay, right? Um, and many doulas, if they aren't able to earn a living wage, they aren't able to provide the services. And then acceptance of services. So many medical providers are unclear about a doula's role and benefits their patients and actually will discourage um, their patients from having a doula. So these all create barriers to access and doula care, which is therefore underutilized among all women and families, specifically in black and brown communities. Doulas can be further integrated into comprehensive systems of support along with medical providers to influence the mother's health choices in order to improve birth outcomes. But not many providers recommend doulas, even though the benefits to patients are very clear. 
Doulas do not work for medical providers or medical institutions where their loyalty to their clients may be compromised. Doulas work for families and keep the family centered. Doulas see themselves as part of the family's birth team and want parents to have great birth outcomes too. Hopefully, with more medical providers understanding the scope and benefits of doulas, a relationship can be developed with all involved so that everyone is working toward the same goals together, which are great birth outcomes. So why should we break these barriers? African Americans specifically often report receiving worse interpersonal health care than their white counterparts. There's also a huge trust issue based on historical trauma and mistreatment within the medical system. Doulas, specifically community doulas who are among those populations and who have racial, cultural, and experiential similarities to birthing people can help to build trust with the parent and are in a position to be able to see and prevent overt effects of institutional racism, classism, institutional bias within healthcare systems, and then to mitigate many of the negative effects of social determinants of health that would normally impact the health of the birthing person and their children. Providing culturally relevant care and having racial concordance between vulnerable families and doulas can enhance the benefits that are already associated with doula support. And then this is a video. Um, and we actually have put a few videos in here, each for a different reason, but I think that this will give you an, a good idea of what this looks like. We can't hear it, Jen. Give me 30 seconds. Let me see if I have to. Um, get down. No problem. Can, get, can people, oh, okay. Um, I'm gonna stop sharing. I, there was mute, there was sound coming out, but it was just really low. Well, I didn't hear it at all. I'm not sure if anyone else heard it. Okay. No, I couldn't I'll, hear it. Okay, I'll stop sharing and then I'll do again. Give me one second. I think you just have to unmute yourself, Jen. Oh, well, then let's try that. I know on Zoom you have to share computer sound. I'm not sure about Teams. My volume was down on my home computer, like on my desktop, so maybe it was affecting the volume and I'll unmute myself to see if that supports it as well. Thank you guys for all the tips. Hopefully I can pull this together. Okay, let's try again. Oh, because of an error. Wait a second. Okay. One second again, guys. I'm sorry. Okay. You can see the screen now? Yep. Yep. Amadoma Bediako is a retired Better? grade school teacher. Yes. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jessica. But. Oh, stop it. I'm sorry, guys. I can't pull it together. Amadoma Bediako is a retired grade school teacher. Hi. Hey, Jessica. But she's still dispensing plenty of information. These days, to pregnant women. The most important thing is healthy mommy, healthy baby. Okay. On this day in early August, Bediaco was visiting Jessica Marshall, then seven and a half months pregnant, at her home in Brooklyn. They discuss issues like prenatal health and a birth plan. If you can relax and go into this, you're not so afraid, you're not so tense. Because if you're tight and you're tense and you're worried, it slows it down. Bediaco isn't a doctor or a midwife. She's what's known as a doula. That's ancient Greek for a woman who serves. Doulas support pregnant women before, during, and after childbirth. Being a first-time mother, um, I really wanted to take advantage of all the information that I could. And I know that doulas typically are very supportive of mother's birth plans, so I wanted um, a doula that was supportive of me having a natural birth. The doula serves the woman. We don't work for the hospital. We don't work for the birthing center. We don't work for the midwife. We work for the woman and we're there for her. 
The service is provided for free through a program backed by New York City's Department of Health. It's called the By My Side Birth Support Program, and it's aimed at women living in low-income, largely African-American neighborhoods in Brooklyn, where there are high infant and maternal mortality rates. According to the Centers for Disease Control's latest statistics, nationwide, black women are three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related complications than white women. In New York City, it's almost seven times higher, an average of 63 deaths per 100,000 births for black women compared to nine deaths per 100,000 births for white women. Why do you think that the, there are these high rates of maternal mortality? I think healthcare in general is not as good in this area as in others. Uh, the women have a lot of um, pre-existing conditions, whether it's high blood pressure, asthma, obesity, which also contributes. Um, they just may not be in as good health. Mary Powell Thomas of the By My Side. Mary Powell Thomas is the director of the By My Side Birth Support Program. It was established through a federal grant three and a half years ago when healthcare professionals wanted to address a troubling trend. Many women were showing up to the hospital alone when they were ready to deliver. So far, this program has helped more than 240 women give birth. It became clear that it was really helpful to have a woman who was experienced in childbirth and to be, who could be there to support the woman. But why a doula? Why not um, concentrate in giving the woman more support through a doctor? In a lot of cases, the doctor comes in at the last minute to deliver the baby or maybe comes in a few times to check on the woman but then goes off to do other things. We have doulas who you know, arrive in the morning and they meet the morning nurse and then the night nurse and then the morning nurse comes back the next day and the doula is still there. Traditionally, women birth with other women. The village comes around when a woman's laboring. You know, She has her mother, her grandmother, her sisters, her aunties, and they encourage her. They let her know she can do it. They tell her stories, they laugh together, they cry with her. But critics question whether it's government's role to finance programs like these. Doula care isn't regulated, and doulas aren't licensed professionals. Although certification is available, it isn't required. The American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists doesn't take a position on doulas, but says that continuous support during labor from physicians, midwives, nurses, doulas, or lay individuals may be beneficial for women. They should work together as a team, and they're part of the delivery team and the delivery experience. Did you get a report from everyone? Dr. Raymond Sandler is the director of labor and delivery at the Mount Sinai Hospital in New York. He's a big supporter of doulas and works with them. However, he says that in some cases, there can be challenges. They are non-medical and should stick to non-medical decision-making. At times, and uh, you interview others, you'll find that um, there is some tension between the doula and the physician because the doula, uh, for instance, if the physician wants to do certain in interventions, um, the doula may feel that it's not necessary and injects herself into the decision-making process. I think there are some obstetricians that feel this is just an extra person in the room. They may be getting in the way sometimes. There are, there's definitely a range of attitudes. I think generally as, as there are more and more doulas in a hospital, the staff becomes more comfortable. Um, and it's also you know, important for the doulas to be responsible about that. A main source of tension between doulas and doctors is over the use of C-sections. While the World Health Organization says a C-section is appropriate up to 15% of the time, in the United States, Nearly 33% of all deliveries are done by C-section. Mary Powell Thomas points to a recent review by the Cochrane Collaboration, a nonprofit group that studies the effectiveness of healthcare. After reviewing pregnancy support trials from 16 countries, it determined that continuous support in labor, including the presence of a doula, reduces the likelihood of a C-section by as much as 22%. If a woman is in a situation that is scary, and a medical professional gives her a quick medical ease answer to a question she asks, we might ask, does she need more information? So in that way, we advocate for the mom. It's the power of information that Jessica Marshall says she's counting on in order to have a natural birth. I think some of the things that surprise me are um, what having a lack of knowledge, how that affects um, a mother when she goes to actually give birth and deliver, and how that uh, can 
produce results that she didn't desire, such as a C-section or you know, some other health complication. And we offer free doula services to women. Despite what program participants believe are the benefits of doula programs, and despite the growing popularity of using doulas, there's still only limited insurance coverage to pay for them. The federal government supports a small number of local programs, and Oregon and Minnesota have passed laws allowing Medicaid to pay for doula care. But most women pay anywhere from a few hundred to a few thousand dollars out of their own pocket. Many people see doulas as a luxury. The services are not included in insurance. And here you are providing this luxury to women in low-income areas. Yes, we are. Isn't Why? that great? <laughs> Why? Because it's a proven way to improve birth outcomes, and that's our mission. Thank you. Um, so I just wanted to say that, um, you know, just make it clear that doulas are not making decisions for their clients at all. Um, but what we will do is make sure that the clients have the information that they need in order to make their own decisions. And those decisions may be to have an epidural, to opt for an induction, to have a cesarean section um, that is planned. Whatever it is, we're going to support you. We just want to make sure that the clients have the information that they need to make an informed choice. Um, so I have a question for you all, and I don't know if anybody can unmute, but according to the CDC, how many pregnancy-related deaths do you believe occur in the United States every year? Anybody want to take a guess? 200? Next slide. Thousand. Okay. 700 pregnancy related deaths annually in the United States. That's a lot of people dying every year due to something related to pregnancy. Next slide. According to the CDC, what percentage of pregnancy related deaths are preventable? So of those 700 people that died, how many do you all think um, could have been prevented? 80%. Anybody else want to take a guess? We have some guesses in the chat. We have 85%. We have 75%. We have 100%. <laughs> Another uh, 75. All right, next slide. Let's see the answer. Approximately 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable in the United States. So that's more than half. So over 350 people um, could have been saved. Right. And usually those mistakes are because of medical error. OK, next slide. And this is another video. I hope it works this time. I hope so. <laughs> it will. We'll get it right. My daughter was perfectly healthy. She was perfectly good. Fine. mentally and physically. She was perfectly fine. And she died in that hospital more women are going to die. I mean, it's just that simple. If we don't get a handle on this and turn it around, then more women are going to die. Who was Dominique? First of all, she was my daughter. Dominique was a sister. She was a mom. Dominique was a beautiful, powerful black woman. She was a star that was zapped away from out of this world. She never woke up. And we didn't get a chance to see her. We didn't get a chance to tell her we love her. We didn't get a chance to do anything, to touch her, to do anything. I didn't see my daughter until she had passed and they brought her in the room for the family to come and view. Hey, baby. And I'm looking like, 
but all you people and my daughter died. I, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't understand it. As the rate of mothers dying has decreased across the developed world, it's gone up dramatically in the US. And America's numbers are bad even compared to some in the developing world. Well, why on earth is this happening in America? Well, a lot of campaigners feel that access to medical care is a big part of the problem. The state, which has got the highest rate of maternal mortality, is also the state with the highest proportion of people without health insurance, and that's Texas. We know that Texas is the uninsured capital of the nation. So from the very beginning, we know that more of our residents don't have health care. But a government official I spoke to wouldn't accept that. I don't really believe that's true. I think that the underlying trend for increasing chronic disease in, in this country is really the fundamental underlying cause for the increase in maternal uh, morbidity and mortality across the nation. But there's something else going on, a huge racial disparity in the figures across the U.S. When we're looking at the fact that African-American women are dying at three times the rate, we have to look at what is it about this group specifically. Hey, how are you doing? Good, how are you? People don't want to talk about it. We're post-racial. We had a black president. But our numbers aren't bearing that out. You'll feel the contractions or anything, but the real ones will push. And you, sometimes you will actually see your stomach kind of shrink in a little bit as it... I go to people. I'm seeing people where they are. I think the thing that gets me is there's not the sense of urgency, and it's really an easy fix, I think. We have to sit down with the people who need the help and say, what do you need? And there seems to be this unwillingness to do that. Life goes on. Yours is going on. My daughter's is not going on. You do not tell a parent that just lost her child. Life goes on. The fear is, without a real sense of urgency, many more American women will die before there's even a plan in place to address the problem. So that is some serious stuff. Um, and I know that as home visitors, you all had the opportunity to go into the homes of families. And I really wanted you to see like, you know, what doulas do, um, you know, on their end as well, as far as, you know, going to the people and finding out what do you need? How can we help? Uh, we're really all, all on the same page when it comes to that. So on this screen, you have uh, maternal mortality and the near miss. All of the women that you see here have died due to a pregnancy related issue, except for Serena Williams, right? But she could have also lost her life. She is the near miss. People are dying across socioeconomic classes, across educational status and relationship status as evidenced by um, the pregnancy-related death of pediatric chief resident, Dr. Shanice Williams, Shalon Irving, who was an epidemiologist at the CDC herself, um, Shimani Gibson, Shaisha Washington, who died two hours after a cesarean section. Um, her anesthesiologist is now accused of improperly administering the epidural and failing to provide um, properly some oxygen when she needed it. And that same doctor is being investigated for the mistreatment of another patient who was given a cesarean section without anesthesia. Um, and then there's Amber Isaac, who identified as Black and Puerto Rican. You'll hear more about her later. Um, LaShonda Hazard, 
she's the person next to Serena Williams. Um, and she lived right in our neighboring state of Rhode Island. She posted on social media that her doctors kept sending her home. She was in extreme pain. She posted on social media, I'm literally dying. And LaShonda and her unborn baby died on January 7th of 2019. The list goes on and on, but the common thread here is that they were all black. Um, or identified as Black or related to Black, and they were all ignored. The CDC said that 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable, but these women died, right? So even Kara Johnson, who's up in the upper right-hand corner with her husband, um, they botched her cesarean section, um, and she could have been saved if her medical providers had listened to her husband when he told them that she was not doing well and he alerted them that blood had been in her catheter instead of um, they allowed her to bleed to death for over 10 hours after her husband says um, they, they butchered her, um, completing her cesarean section in just 18 minutes when it should have taken at least an hour and when Charles brought his concerns to the medical staff, he was told, sir, your wife is just not a priority right now. And she died. So Charles and his mother, who you may know, Judge Hatchett, have been raising awareness on maternal mortality since that time. And then of course, Serena Williams, the only one who survived, but almost died. Um, she had blood clots in her lungs and Serena being an athlete, she knows her body, she knew what she needed. Um, but she was ignored. Um, and then there are other partners and families who are left with either having to take care of their babies without their mothers or losing them both. Next slide. So when Serena Williams was telling her doctors about what was happening to her, they told her they were going to use a Doppler. And she's like, a Doppler? I told you I need a CT scan and a heparin drip, right? Because clearly she has had this issue before. She's an athlete. She's very in tune with her body. And she's telling them what she needs. And they're totally ignoring her and trying to do something else. Um, and this, is, this happens very often with Black women um, in the birth space. Next slide. We actually had a client um, that we were working with and she had her baby already and she started developing symptoms that the doula wasn't very comfortable with. And the doula suspected that they could have been related to preeclampsia. The doula recommended that she go to the hospital to be seen. Um, and so the client actually listened to the doula, went to the hospital. She was experiencing swelling. She had chest pain and she communicated this to the hospital staff. This is during COVID, right? So the doula can't go with her. She, she had no partner. She had to leave her baby at home who was seven days old. And she was left in the hospital hallway for four hours, um, waiting to be cared for. And she also could have been added to that list and could have died. Um, fortunately, somebody came and was able to um, care for her. But these are the types of situations that we're dealing with as doulas. Next slide. Disparities exist regardless to whether or not Black women have advanced education, whether they are married, or even if they have high socioeconomic status. That was something that the March of Dimes reported. Think next one. Infant mortality is also an issue in Connecticut. So in 2013, right here in Connecticut, 173 babies died before their first birthday. And that doesn't include babies that died during pregnancy, babies that were born with low birth weights, or babies that were born prematurely. Um, nationally, Puerto Rican babies were two and a half times more likely to die from causes related to maternal complications than non-Hispanic white infants in 2018. And then uh, the infant mortality rate for white women in Connecticut, even though it's significantly lower than the rest of the nation, Connecticut ranked one of the states with the highest overall infant mortality rate. Within those infant deaths, we know that the majority of those babies that died were born specifically to black, followed by Puerto Rican birthing people. Next slide. And this is our last video because I just wanted you all to see how uh, COVID is compounding the issues that already exist. And this is about Amber Isaac, the woman who identified as Black and Puerto Rican. This was racial malpractice. Sorry, guys, I wanted to unmute myself because we were. This was 
racial malpractice that took Amber. We lost someone very, very, very important to us. Amber was the light to everyone's life. Her energy was just amazing. She was just so loving, so caring. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, Amber Isaac lost her life while giving birth to her son. You're ready for a father. The fact that she never got to meet him really tears me apart. Bruce McIntyre says his partner faced neglect at the Montefiore Medical Center in the Bronx. This would not have happened if Amber was white. If Amber was white, she would still be here today. She would still be here. According to McIntyre, red flags started to appear during Isaac's second trimester when she couldn't get an in-person appointment due to the pandemic. In March, she was just getting like Zoom conferences, telehealth. Um, they were they gave her a blood pressure monitor. She wasn't being seen that whole month. Amber's calling, reaching out, hey, I need this, I need the results back from the blood work. You know, the baby's due date is close. Nobody's reaching back out to us. When Isaac received her test results, she learned that her platelet levels were dangerously low and was rushed to the hospital for an emergency C-section. Doctors learned Isaac had HELP syndrome, a serious condition that affects the blood and liver. Days before going to the hospital, Isaac sent her final tweet, can't wait to write a tell-all about my experience during my last two trimesters dealing with incompetent doctors at Montefiore. I said my goodbyes to Amber, I couldn't hug her, couldn't kiss her, I just had a you know, try to talk her through it because um, she was scared, she was nervous. That was the last time I saw her. The last thing she had me doing was talking and singing to her stomach. That's what I did every night. At age 26, Amber Isaac died during the C-section with no family members around her. Amber Rose Isaac, it's such a sad um, story because of all the things that we know could go wrong did. She advocated for herself and she still lost her life these fractures in our healthcare system, this dismissing of Black women, of women in general, is causing death. Their symptoms not being listened to, being turned away, not being evaluated, um, not being taken seriously. Those small choices can be deadly for Black birthing people. According to the CDC, Black women are about three times more likely to die of pregnancy-related causes than white women. About 60% of pregnancy-related deaths are preventable. Really, our entire healthcare system has to be revamped so that we make sure that people like Emma Rose Isaac are seen and valued, especially as we move to more telemedicine and not in-person health, because that's here to stay. We need to ensure that we look at Emma Rose Isaac's case as an opportunity of learning of what we really need to do differently. In a statement, the Montefiore Medical Center said 94% of our deliveries are minority mothers, and Montefiore's maternal mortality rate of 0.01% is lower than both New York City and national averages. Any maternal death is a tragedy. I used to sing to him and everything, play the piano for him and Amber while he was in her womb, and he always heard music, right? Yeah, he always heard music. In honor of Isaac, McIntyre started the Save a Rose Foundation to raise awareness about the racial inequality Black women face during pregnancy. Amber was very big on her community. With Save a Rose, I want to do like a lot of community engagement. I'm working with Birth from the Earth right now. We just put together a scholarship program that offsets the costs of insurance premiums. So whatever insurance doesn't cover, this program covers, and that's in Amber's honor. We have to lead by example. You know, we have to fight for what's right. So that's all of the morals that I want Elias growing up with. Um, want him to carry that out throughout his lifetime. Um, everything that we're doing, um, I want him to be able to continue. Be happy. Thank you. You're welcome. I can't speak. All right, we have so much work to do. So we're going to get into who we are and 
why we're doing well we you you saw why we're doing it right so who we are and what our program looks like we are a fun group of doulas and perinatal health advocates who love to incorporate the wisdom and cultural healing practices of our ancestors into our care while providing culturally relevant and evidence-based services we come to the people as the people because we are the people and our ultimate goal is to hold space for all families no matter where they are in their childbearing year phase or process while reducing racial disparities and perinatal outcomes. We are the protectors of their space. So if you decide to apply for the program and you're chosen to be a student, you will learn how to understand the physiology of birth and the emotional needs of the client, helping families plan for labor and birth and help them to achieve their goals as best as possible. Um, stay with them through, you know, through the labor and immediate postpartum period, whether in person or virtual, um, providing clients with an objective viewpoint and continue to provide non-judgmental support no matter what the client's choices and decisions are for their birth and care. Um, we're providing clients with emotional support as well as helping them with physical comfort measures during labor. We're helping them to get the information that they need so that they can make informed choices. We are helping them to, uh, we're helping to facilitate the communication between the medical staff and uh, the labor and family. We're helping the partner and other support people by showing them how to care for the client during labor and keeping them aware of what's going on and what the process is, um, trying to keep them involved as much as possible as well. Next slide. Can I stop for one second and interject just by, mm -hmm. by way of context, just to remind you guys that this um, this project is three prong, right? And so um, Sayana is doing the awesome work to bridge the gap between existing doulas in the workforce, um, with the world of home visiting. Um, so she has uh, folk who are going to be supporting their training. Um, when she says the students will and says you have the opportunity, the funding also allow for us to have 30 home visiting um, or Office of Early Childhood home visiting staff um, be trained by Earth's Natural Touch. So that's what we're talking about and she'll get into more. But just for that context, there was someone who asked that question. Yes, I'm. Um, I didn't see it. I'm sorry. I'm actually not even following the chat. Yeah, so I, didn't even caught that. I was going to follow. I was. I was writing a list at the end. Thank yep. you. Okay, okay, cool. The other two prongs, um, Lisa. It's the doulas that exist being trained, the doulas that are being trained, um, by Sayana's team, and then the last is the babies being supported. So those three are the three goals. Um, okay, so yes, so understanding the physiology. Oh, I'm sorry, did I do that slide already or did I not? Okay, yes, I did that one, next. Okay, so there are several steps that we wanna take, right? And I don't have to read all of these, but we definitely wanna support fathers and partners who would like to be active participants in the pregnancy by showing them how to support the mother in healthy ways, um, helping the families to create their own birth philosophies, advocating for uh, parent-friendly childbirth settings, increasing the number of pregnant people who receive proper prenatal care beginning in their first trimester, providing community resources when we can, um, advocating against unnecessary interventions by providing the families with the information that they need to make their decisions, and, um, you know, making sure that the communication is good, you know, even down to um, decreasing the use of alcohol and tobacco and illegal drugs during pregnancy and encouraging good health and nutrition and exercise. There's so many different things that we want to do to try to make sure that um, people have great birth outcomes. Next slide. The ultimate goal, healthy client, healthy baby, healthy family, and all together healthy communities. Because if we have all of those pieces, then we have a healthy community. Next slide. So during the program, there are several class topics that um, will be um, done. So the first class would be the life of a doula, where you would learn about understanding the scope, demands, and responsibilities while being a professional and remembering to implement self-care strategies. We also talk about the maternal health crisis, so being culturally competent, humble, and aware as a birth doula and perinatal health advocate among diverse communities and cultures, including birth in the LGBT. LGBTQ community, the effects of medical apartheid, health inequity, and implicit bias on communities of
of color, understanding the pregnancy journey, so normal fetal development, a mother's physical and emotional changes, prenatal warning signs, understanding screening and diagnostic tests, some medical terminology, um, learning about the purpose and power of the pain in labor. So hormones, surges, fetal positioning, comfort techniques, labor interventions and complications. Then of course the postpartum period. So mother baby care or mama total care, the amazing placenta and the recovery from vaginal and cesarean births. Next slide. We will talk about breastfeeding and lactation. So how amazing milk is, myth busting, troubleshooting, the politics behind breastfeeding, um, understanding nutritional and physical needs during the pregnancy and postpartum period while learning to support those needs through diverse dietary choices and also physical movement. We'll talk about toxic relationships and intimate partner violence. So recognizing abuse um, and supporting them while you know protecting and healing ourselves. Um, the realities of adolescent pregnancy and the unique role of being a doula, um, the effects of sexual abuse and womb trauma on the childbearing year, understanding reproductive rights, reproductive justice, recognizing obstetric violence, trauma-informed and responsive care, understanding and supporting families through perinatal grief and loss, and then, of course, a final exam. So some of the skills, and I'm just going to run through these, you know, um, comfort techniques, tools and tricks for labor management, basic science of breastfeeding, newborn care. Next. Of course, anatomy and physiology, um, self-care, partner involvement, effective stress and racism, navigating concerns in the workplace, um, the effects of illegal drugs and medications, domestic violence, STDs. Uh, positions during labor, complications, timing contractions, cesarean section management pre and post. Next. Um, newborn appearance, body changes, reflexes, newborn warning signs, perinatal grief and support, um, cultural humility and responsiveness, personal safety and self-defense as a doula, um, on-call survival, doula do's and don'ts, how a history of sexual assault can affect childbearing. Next slide. What's in your birth bag? So things to pack with you if you're going to a birth. What's the RH factor? Um, ruptured water, so artificially rupturing um, the membranes or spontaneously if the water breaks. What are some concerns with the amniotic fluid? Postpartum emotions, so how to spot the baby blues and postpartum mood disorders. Next slide. Uh, we're gonna learn about the placenta, optimal fetal positioning, pregnancy with multiples, any umbilical cord complications, um, maternal health concerns like lupus or sickle cell or MS, and other pregnancy concerns like gestational diabetes or preeclampsia and more. So what is expected of you as a student? Next slide. It's a rigorous program. So there will be homework. There are articles or handouts that you have to create. Some group projects might be thrown in there. Um, you're going to be expected to do a presentation. And we definitely want you to be a support to your fellow classmates and coworkers. We've all come together for one common cause, and we're going to continue to grow on this travel um, and travel this journey together. Next slide. So we are a non-judgmental group. Each of us will grow in our own way through the program. It's not a competitive space. We are a supportive circle. We are dedicated to enhancing our doula skills and continuing our education. We will educate each other through learning and sharing. Next slide. What applicants need to know. So you will be charged with having to step out of your comfort zone. You need to be willing to grow. You don't need any advanced degrees or credentials. They are beneficial on the table, but they are not a huge determining factor in our decision to accept students. But what is important? Next slide. 
We want to make sure that you all are passionate about the birth process. You're able to take constructive criticism. You're not thrown off by challenging situations. You understand medical terms and can explain them. Have good communication skills. You practice active listening. You can communicate with medical providers with respect. You stay within your scope of care. You remain calm even in emergency situations. You're reassuring to clients and their families. Um, you have, you know, good physical activity might be needed for in-person support, right? You know when to speak, when to listen, when to do nothing. You may have to sacrifice your previous plans for somebody if they're in labor. You want to be knowledgeable about infant feeding and lactation. You know about labor positions and comfort techniques. You recognize your own limitations. You are patient. You help families stay centered during the perinatal period. But most of all, we want people who are going to move with integrity and do not take anything personally. So I think Cynthia is gonna step in and tell you about some of the things that we've been doing as an organization, just so that you can kind of have an understanding um, more about who we are and who you are gonna be affiliating yourselves with if you are interested in applying for the program. Good, can you hear me okay, Sai? I hear you, yes. Very good, hi everybody. I'm sorry about my microphone issues. We're just going to get right into it and talk about some of our recent activities. And this is just 2021, but many of the activities and roles have been um, going on since 2021. Some of, and this is just the fruition of some of the other work that we have done. Spring of 2021, we're invited to Southern Connecticut State University's Reproductive Justice Panel. We've also provided uh, Optimus Health provider training, how can doulas and doctors work together to address racial disparities and birth outcomes in Bridgeport, Connecticut. There was also a training for Yale Health Justice medical students, and we're with them um, practically every year for the last few years doing a training with them. Um, also in spring of 2021, we had our National Poetry Month event with uh, New Haven Healthy Start, which was spoken word. It was very inspiring. And the theme was Black Maternal Health Month. For the summer of 2021, once again, we were invited to March of Dimes and Yukon's Racial Disparities in Maternal Morbidity and Mortality Conference. And we spoke about the doula's role in navigating structural racism to eliminate disparities and improve birth outcomes in Connecticut. We also had our inaugural 12 week summer support group series. Uh, this came from a grant opportunity that was given to us from the March of Dimes uh, through United Ways local program in Bridgeport, Bridgeport Prospers. And some of the topics that we covered, and it, it was quite powerful, was talking about self-advocacy, self-care during pregnancy and postpartum, how to build your dream team, the impact of trauma and violence on pregnancy, medical provider relationships, mental health care, Perinatal, uh, excuse me, perinatal mood and anxiety disorders, grief and loss, sex after baby, child spacing. We invited dads, partners, and doulas. We talked about infant safety, feeding the baby, and then we invited the uh, whole village to come on board, all of those that would be supporting the birth person. And we also had doulas that were conducting these series, as well as other professionals from around the state. It was very exciting. Uh, also, summer of 2021, Governor Lamont did sign SB1 into law, which defines the doula as a profession. And more recently, and I think we have one more module left, we have started conducting childbirth education, which is actually a three-week series. Next slide. And this is just us um, doing our thing. Uh, we conducted town halls to uh, 
get community food feedback and also provide information about what we were trying to do as doulas and in their community. We want to hear from the community, right? We want to know what it is that they need. And that middle picture was the first year that there was a bill. That was a couple of years ago, a couple of sessions ago, uh, prior to the pandemic, um, just introducing the first bill that would address doula certification and Medicaid reimbursement for doula services. And so uh, many of us were able to travel up to Hartford and we were able to give testimony. Um, there's also another opportunity coming up and we could always use everyone's support. And there's also letter writing as well. And this is um, brought to everyone's um, well, the, the information and all of the work is done through primarily doulas for Connecticut, which is the coalition here in Connecticut where we're all working together. And we're going to talk about that in the next slide. Next slide is doulas for Connecticut, which is a coalition that is an collaborative of doulas, community members, and other state and national organizations who are interested in helping families across the state gain access to doula support and who also want to see doulas make a livable wage for the work that they do. This coalition was started in 2019 and has been working with our champion, Senator Moore, who was the first one to introduce legislation regarding uh, the professionalism of doulas certification and um, also bringing up the conversation regarding Medicaid reimbursement for doula services. We have also been working with the Public Health Committee leadership, Senator Abrams, Representative Steinberg, to introduce language to define the doula profession in this legislative session. And SB1, as we mentioned, did pass. And Connecticut Dua Coalition members are representatives from Earth's Natural Touch, Birth Care and Beyond, Health Equity Solutions, Planned Parenthood, March of Dimes, United Ways, and community members, and, and so much more. Next slide. Talk a little bit about our ENT teams. And as Sayana had mentioned, there are some doulas who go on to specialize in certain areas that can be helpful to families giving birth. Uh, we have fertility journey specialists, grief and law specialists, research and writing specialists, nutrition and body system science, equity and inclusion of marginalized communities, breastfeeding lactation specialists, mental health and perinatal mood and anxiety disorder specialists, virtual pregnancy partners, which because of COVID-19 concerns, that became a very big deal. Uh, photography, birth photography, birth and reproductive justice, uh, resources and outreach, trauma-informed and responsive care teams, postpartum and newborn care teams. And we're developing more and more groups as we go on, depending on what is needed in the community. Next slide. And during the pandemic, we did create our first permanent support group. It started last August during, uh, in August 2020, during Black Breastfeeding Week, um, Mocha Milkshake Cafe. And we recognize that Connecticut, as well as many other states across the country, has first food deserts for people of color and lactation support is needed beyond the doula services we provide. Some of our doulas have become certified lactation counselors and facilitate the Mocha Milkshake Cafe Lactation Support Group. And we have been meeting weekly for over a year now. We've had over 100 participants come through at least once. And we have some moms that I tease now and call vintage moms because their babies are anywhere from like 10 months to over a year old. And so even though it's facilitated by Earth's Natural Touch, it is peer run. Mocha Milkshake is a uh, Cafe is a safe space for families within our priority populations to come, 
ask questions, meet other breastfeeding families, discuss concerns, challenges, and to share their experience, solutions, and tips for success. Okay, Sai. Thanks, Sin. So overall, you know, we're doing all of this work because we really want to build community. And, you know, as we are continuing to do all of the different things that we're doing, we are um, building a stronger network and stronger community um, systems. Next slide. I just put some pictures here so you can see us. <laughs> Um, and it feels good to run into your clients out in the community at different events and things like that. Of course, prior to COVID, you know, we would go places and see families that we've supported. And the next slide, you can see, um, you know, it also feels good to be able to watch these babies grow. So my very first doula baby is almost 20 years old now, October, um, he'll be 20. And um, so we, you know, as doulas get to see like, wow, we really had an impact on, you know, this, this family and the community overall. Next slide. So um, I know Jennifer kind of touched on some of the overview of the project, but here we are again, just to touch on it, just so that you can kind of have an idea. The program is open to all home visiting programs. Even if you have an active doula program already, we just want to make sure that if you do have funding, that you're mindful of that and that you're not using resources that you really don't need. We don't want to take opportunities away from communities that actually do need it. Um, we have a network of doulas across the state who speak English, Spanish, Portuguese, Haitian Creole, and Portuguese Creole, um, and we're vetting more. Services will be provided primarily virtually with the option for in-person doula support in specific circumstances. A lot of hospitals are still not allowing a second support person in. Um, some hospitals are, but as we've experienced, that can change day to day. Um, and we have been able to provide really good virtual support to, to our families. And we're set to support 100 families across the state um, over the next year or so. So if you're interested in becoming a doula with us, our goal is to train, you know, 30 home visitors to become doulas within the state. Um, students will meet, as of now, we're looking at once a week to work our way through the program. And the training is not exclusive to women or those who, ident who identify as women. Anyone can apply. If you're interested, you're welcome to apply once the application is posted. Um, and that should be going out, you know, in the next couple of weeks or so. Next slide. Um, and there may be some supervisors on the call. There may be some home visitors that are trying to figure out, well, what, what would this look like if a family is interested in doula support? So basically, the home visitor would share information about the doula program, and the client would share with the home visitor that they're interested in working with a doula. So that home visitor would present the family to their clinical supervisor, and that supervisor and home visitor would work to complete the referral form, um, which we would receive. And... Um, once we get the referral form, we'll contact the family for, you know, an intake of sorts, and then we'll get them matched up to a doula to support them. We're hoping to have like weekly check-ins for people, um, you know, as they continue, you know, doulas, as they continue to go through the program and support families. We do that with other programs that we run, and it's really helpful for the doulas to get together and share ideas and learn from each other. Um, and share successes too. Like, you know, I had a client that was dealing with this issue and this is how we work to, to get her to resources or to solve the problem. Um, there is also a research piece that's gonna be done by UConn, which you'll hear about in a minute. And we'll go to the next slide. I think, I switched, I, think I switched you up. There. Oh, okay. It goes right into there. But before oh, we do that, we have some questions in the chat that I wanna support. Okay. Um, you to answer. First and foremost, Ooh. people heard the weeks, um, but didn't hear the number of weeks. So how many weeks is the training? Well, that's the thing. So I didn't put it specifically and y'all are smart because y'all caught that. Um, so our training is usually 14 months, right? But we're hoping to meet maybe once a week as opposed to the entire 14 months. So it could take up to eight months or so, I'm thinking, to complete the entire training. Okay, so weekly meetings and the meetings would be, would they be a full day training or? 
They would be four hours. So four maybe hours. like, yeah, from like an eight to 12 or 8.30 to 12.30 or something like that once a week. Yeah. Okay. So that's the training. In terms of the application process, the mm -hmm. applications will be made available in the next couple of weeks and you'll get those um, sent out to you guys through um, your program liaisons. Yeah. Um, there, Jessica asked a question about a flyer, about doing yeah. services and brochure and marketing that. information. So all of that information will be uh, provided to you guys in a package to be able to share with your families, um, as well as the referral form. So you'll get as, mm -hmm. as clinical supervisors, a package. So one email will have the training schedule, the application, marketing materials and all of the the that sort of things and that will be coming out in the next couple of weeks there is no cost to the family there is no cost to the home visitor there was also come a, a question that came up about um, a home visitor taking on a role such as this and the shifts of their jobs and things of that nature um i am hoping or we're all hoping that through the um uh, through this experience, we can increase the number of doulas that are available in the state of Connecticut. Um, we haven't worked through once people have the skills under their belt, what would that look like in terms of a role and um, um, uh, capacity issues within the state, but the commissioner has, um, has uh, endorsed this project, wants the home visitors to be able to have this um, experience, if, um, and so in the next couple of months, we'll kind of really think through if we're going to be able to structure contracts moving forward such that we're able to have home visitors have a paired shared uh, role that is half doula, half um, home visitor. We haven't really gone that far with it, um, but the we're at this point we're offering the training. It's available now, so it's like the timing is is slightly off. Um, and so we're offering the training in the next couple of months, and we can think through as a as a network. I think um, how we want to roll this out. The questions are flying, and so what I'm trying to do is to go there. Lisa Candles. Um, Always oh, these thoughts on home visitors will become at rate of pay, change in job expectations, all of those things. Um, so we're working through all of those and welcome all of your feedback. When does um, doula support start with prenatal families? What we've been able to do is we've been able to structure um, support. I think the virtual are about eight sessions. There are a couple prenatal sessions that are virtual. Then there's the time that a doula has with um, the family for the birthing, and then there's post um, sessions. And so um, those are distributed. Maybe I think, um, Sayana, you can correct me. I don't have the, the guide in front of me. I think there's three on the front end, the birthing experience, and then a couple on the back end. And so that's um, what that looks like. And um, prenatal with families, I mean, as, as soon as we're able to link a family with a doula, um, do you, do you have a timing that you're comfortable with saying? I don't think. Yeah. So. so what's happening is, you know, we probably won't get this going, um, you know, for a little while because we still have to get you all the applications, right? You have to complete the applications. We have to sort through the applications. We have to get your recommendations from your supervisors and all of those different pieces. Um, and then we want to meet you to see if this is something that you really want to do. Um, and that could take a while, right? So let's just say, and I don't know if it's going to take all the way till January, but let's just say we started in January. Um, by the time you all would finish training, it would probably be around August time or so. Um, and at that time, if we have doulas from the network that are already out there supporting families, you all will be able to jump on with them as like backup support so that at least you can get some experience and see how they're doing things um, in hopes that because every every client is going to have a, a doula and a backup. Um, in hopes that, you know, eventually you'll be able to be that primary doula. Um, cause I know a lot of doulas are kind of afraid to just be thrown out there as primary doulas if they haven't even been able to have any experience doing it yet. So, so there, there was a couple more questions, Sayana. Um, yeah. the things are going to be virtual. 
Yeah. Um, Daisy had a question. Is the project accepting referrals now for the free uh, birth doula services to prenatal moms? Like Sayana said, there's gonna, we're a couple weeks away from being able to give you the referral forms. But as soon as those referral forms, we have some training to do with our current doulas as well. And so I think the January time frame is, is probably most realistic for um and I, I say that only to give us the uh, most time humanly possible to onboard our existing doulas. And um, as soon as that's done, then we'll be able to pair uh, those existing doulas. Do we have any statistics or information about the deaths or complications related to elective C-sections? And so, Sayana, she's asking if the um, if the the stats around the deaths of um of moms during C-sections, were we able to whittle down to those exact numbers? And right. So that- I don't know if we have that specifically for Connecticut, but I do know that the, the risk for cesarean sections are a lot higher, right? Um, and that's because it is major abdominal surgery. Um, there is likelihood of hemorrhage, more likelihood of hemorrhage. And during a cesarean section, more blood is lost than with the vaginal birth. This is why, you know, vaginal birth is, you know, um, you recommend it. This is why, you know, if you have twins, they'll try to, even if one is born vaginally and the other one is born through cesarean, they want to at least try vaginally um, to try to see if both of them will come out that way, because we know that um, there are risk, higher risk with cesarean sections. Um, and why is elective cesarean uh, even allowed in, in the United States? I think that's what you said. Yeah. Um, unfortunately, as you can see uh, around the world, the United States has all of this medical technology and all of the ability to intervene when we want to. Um, and that seems to be working at a div- disadvantage because the more technology we get, the worse our outcomes are um, in other countries where they kind of leave things alone and just let nature take its, its course. Um, they don't have as many issues, but the medical model of care is not really woman centered like the midwifery model of care, for example. Um, so a lot of uh, decisions are made based on hospital policy, the convenience of the medical provider as opposed to what's best for the mother and baby. And so elective cesarean is allowed to happen when we know that there are risk. And unfortunately, some of those pictures of the women that I showed you had, um, you know, inductions that led to cesarean sections. And so, um, We know that the number of maternal deaths are higher when a cesarean section is involved. I hope I answered. I know I was kind of all over the place. And also, we have also uh, realized that the increase in C-sections has gone way up during the pandemic, like almost immediately. Mm -hmm. That has been the immediate response to um, those families that are giving birth in hospitals during the pandemic and that's something to consider as well. So Kelly has a question. Thank you guys. Um, Kelly has a question. When do you anticipate having chosen the 30 applicants? I think Sayana gave uh, a typical um, or uh, the planned um, uh, approach to having people onboarded. And so we think um, late December, having people selected with the start of January. Um, Jen Vendetti, hi Jen. Um, asked if only um, prenatal families can refer and be sent to postpartum. We have um, calculated the number of families based on the full um, uh, set of services, which is pre the giving the birth, um, supporting the birth, as well as postpartum uh, doula work. That is something that we can think about restructuring, Jen. Um, it wasn't raised as a... as, as um, when we were designing the program. And so that's something that I can bring back to the table. So I can't say a hard no um, just yet, but we, we, we shall see how that works out. And if we can kind of restructure um, the total births that we have and then pull back on some of that to be able to provide so many families of postpartum doula support. And so I'll, I'll, I'll think through that with the rest of the team. Is that okay? And get back to you. Yeah, I, I think that, the continuum of support, the way it would be built is perfect. And Mm -hmm. in our program, we do have uh, a doula 
subcontract program, yep. and that is how we will build it as well. But okay. you will see, because I know how busy you are, we have a, a crisis case and it's just postpartum need. Oh my God. So okay. that's why I asked. So maybe that Thank should you. be just an exception to the rule. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I'd, I'd love to revisit that. So Sayana, please put a pin in that. Yeah. Um, hey, Ben, it's good to see you. I yeah, wanted to good say, to see um, you too, Sayana. Hi, we, Cynthia. We have another program Hi, where we had to readjust. Um, mm. so we went in with the idea of just doing, you know, pregnancy support. And then some families were saying, I just want postpartum. You know, I know that postpartum is really going to be an issue for me. Is it possible for me to get that? And we we did have to readjust. So definitely something that we're open to, to looking at and trying to figure out how we can just support people. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Some thank you guys for that. Thank you for the raising that, Jen. Um, Jill asked to send out the slides. I only didn't send them out beforehand um, just because they belong to Earth's Natural uh, Touch. So I have to check with Sayana to see what she is able to send out. Um, and then that version can be PDF'd and then sent out to you guys as well. So I'll um, circle back with Sayana and Cynthia um, to see what's the most appropriate to share with you guys. Um, I'm glad to see that you're super interested, Tiffany. Um, start to have that dialogue with your clinical supervisor about uh, the possibility of putting an application for this. The existing doulas are paid and available 24/7 for labor support. The um, so they they will um, they it is billed. It's prepaid. It's paid per birth. So um, a potential doula will, if paired with a family will support um, some prenatally, um, and then the entire labor um, is put into the, the cost um, for, for the birth, and then um, a post uh, uh, support. So yes, Melissa, it's paid for. And um, I think Melissa might be asking, like, you mean the existing doulas, the doulas who are already doulas that are not mm -hmm. home visitors become, you know, going to be trained? Um, they are available. So they're doulas who are available. You know, if somebody calls them and says that they're in labor, um, mm -hmm. yes, they are available. I hope, I hope we answered you. <laughs> okay. Um, and so any Spanish speaking doulas, Sayana, you can talk to the, uh, the reach that you are trying to put out there in terms of, uh, having doulas that, uh, support all families. Yeah. So, you know, the program is open, right. But we do have priority populations. Um, and, you know, Earth's Natural Touch, you know, we were created because we were pretty tired of just the white framework, the standard that was considered, you know, um, the cream of the crop that wasn't really meeting the needs of the community. So when we created this, we created this specifically for black and brown people um, to support them in their specific needs. Um, so we're always looking for doulas who can help us to reach those populations. Um, and like I said, the program is open to anybody. So we're not turning anybody away because as you all saw, maternal mortality, infant mortality is an issue in the country, period. That's just among, you know, um, <laughs> all over the place, right? Not just black and brown families, but everybody is experiencing this issue. But we just have it a little bit worse. Um, and Cynthia works, does a lot of postpartum work with families. And so she has like kind of like an inside view into some of the other issues that families have that are not in our communities that, um, you know, are white families. And she can tell you that they have some uh, serious situations that they're dealing with as well. Um, hospitals are not treating them kindly. They're also dealing with perinatal mood and anxiety disorders. They also don't have a lot of support, um, but they just have better birth outcomes. But that doesn't mean that they don't need the support. So, um, you know, we're looking for people who are willing to do the work across the board. Um, if you speak other languages, that's even, you know, more beneficial because that means that we can reach more families. So guest has a question about training available for other women. And I'm assuming that you mean by that other women who do not work for the OEC. Um, Earth's Natural Touch does this work. Um, and so they are um, 
you can connect with them or connect that other woman or, yep. or some other person that is interested in this training um, directly to Sayana and her contact information can be provided to you guys to be able to link that person up who would be interested in training. However, their training costs will not be covered by the Office of Early Childhood. It is only Office of Early Childhood staff who are supported by this funding that is able to go yep. through this particular cohort, which will be a closed cohort for our teams, mm -hmm. um, for our staff. Uh, and, and those are the only folk who will be uh, covered, their, their fees be covered. Yes, and we are actually getting ready to start the enrollment period. Our annual enrollment for um, will open this, this fall. So yeah, if you know somebody, get them over to us as soon as possible. And <laughs> All right, so we'll share her contact information. Um, uh, and if there are, I think we made it through and hopefully um, will the home visitor be certified doula, what credentials will be provided? And so the question about credentialing, um, Sayana, mm -hmm. for these home yeah. visitors. Yeah, so doulas in general are unregulated. Um, you have individual companies that have set up their own certifications like Earth's Natural Touch. So you'll be certified as a, a doula through Earth's Natural Touch's agencies and organizations program um, because you're coming through um, the OEC program. So yes, you will be considered a certified doula. Awesome. Are there any um, final questions? Not final questions. We have a little bit of time, but I do want to provide the opportunity for our uh, Lee's Research Associate, Molly Car um, Charter, to uh, be able to share uh, the research component of this project. Because uh, just like you guys um, know, it's in the numbers and in the, you know, proving that we are, you know, improving um, birth outcomes um, and sh the sheer experience and um, of, of our families being different, um, that is going to support us to go back to the commissioner and ask for uh, continued funding to support this uh, this pilot. And so I want to um, invite Molly to unmute and to join us and share uh, the doula project evaluative piece. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Can you hear me okay? I can. Awesome. Great. So um, I'm all, I can't see those slides. Are they up? Oh, they are. I'm sorry. So we're at no. the first one that says uh, doula project evaluation in your title and name. Oh, let me see. See anything either. Oh, you, guys, oh, I, oh, you know why? Because I'm not sharing. Ah. <laughs> it's, you know, I tell you. <laughs> Boom. Are we there? Yes. Yeah, you're there. Thanks so much. Oh. oh, now it disappeared. <laughs> there you go. Are you kidding me? Okay. We there? <laughs> yep. It's there. We're, okay. we're there. So um, thank you, Jen, and thanks so much for having me. Um, so I'm Molly Charter. I'm a research associate with the Yukon OEC Partnership. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about our role in evaluating the doula project. So over the next few months, you may hear from me or other members of our team. And I wanted to give you a sense of what we're hoping to accomplish and why we might be contacting you. Next slide, please. Okay. So in this brief overview, I'm going to explore the purpose of the evaluations that we'll be doing, the reasons or background for doing this evaluation, and our general plan for evaluation. Next slide, please. So the doula project is being implemented as a part of the preschool development grant. It's a large grant that's generally, generally meant to improve services for young children and families. And as a part of the grant, the Yukon OEC partnership is evaluating many of the programs that are under the auspices of the PDG. So we're hoping to gain information from various groups involved in doula services, including the doulas themselves and the families that utilize services. And we want to better understand how doula services help families with an ultimate goal of contributing towards the continuation of services like this, even after the grant ends. Next slide, please. So we talked, um, Sayana talked about this, some of the videos talked about this, but um, when doing an evaluation, we always start off by trying to understand the problem better. So here you can see some of the statistics about birth disparities in Connecticut by race and ethnicity. So black families experience infant mortality almost three times as often as non-Hispanic white families in Connecticut. 
Black mothers are 1.5 times more likely to experience a preterm birth than non-Hispanic white mothers, and Hispanic families also experience preterm births at a higher rate than non-Hispanic white families. Mothers of Black and Hispanic backgrounds are far more likely to give birth to a baby classified as being of low birth weight. Next slide, please. So and after under, trying to better understand the, the problem, we always go to the literature next to see what research has been done and what's been found so far. So these are some of the things that Sayonar talked about. Um, previous research on doula services have found, has found that there's shorter labor processes, there's fewer cesarean and forced up deliveries and less need for analgesia, gesia, if I said that right. Um, increased breastfeeding initiation, reduction in birth-related complications and low birth weight, and reduction in cases of postpartum depression. So these are sort of all, uh, or some of the things that Sayana was referring to, we're seeing in the literature, and as she presented, we're seeing in the literature that the doula services are extremely helpful um, for birth outcomes. So some of the research considerations that we'll be thinking about um, as qualitative studies of, of doulas indicate that similar race, ethnicity, and experience are important to the doula relationship. So that's something we'll be thinking about, especially as race, race and ethnicity are um, a focus of this evaluation. And selection bias is a large barrier in many studies. So um, what some researchers have found is that those who tend to utilize doula services are different in important ways than those who don't. And so what will be um, important is to, in a general way, try to ensure that many families are aware of doula, doula services, what they're about, and that recruitment for families into um, the doula project is done in a way that it's um, that everyone is kind of becoming aware of it and what they can do to help. Next slide, please. So we've developed um, a tentative research plan to examine several facets of the doula project. So the first one is to to talk to existing doulas. We'd like to survey or interview existing doulas with a focus on their experiences related to race and ethnicity. So we want to ask questions like. Do clients tend to be diverse in terms of race, ethnicity, and socioeconomic status? What are the barriers, if any, to reaching women of color? Are there perceived differences of birth experiences between white and women of color clients? We also want to um, evaluate, or really not evaluate, but, but talk to new home visiting doulas. So those of you who decide to, or those of uh, anyone who's not here too, that decides to uh, engage in the doula project and become a home visiting doula, um, we'd like to learn more about your, experiencing, your experiences both before and after the training. Uh, we'd like to talk to mothers and partners of, of those who use doula services. So we'd like to know about their experiences using doula services, what worked for them, um, what were their previous birth experiences like, if any, what was their experience like with a doula, and possible pre and post birth interviews as well. We'd like to talk to, or we'd like to learn more from home visiting families. So we just want to understand in a general way what the perceptions are of doulas among those who um, utilize home visiting services. And as we did today, we sent out a short five, about five item survey. So it was a five, five item survey to existing home visitors or providers before the introduction to the doula project. So that was just a little bit of getting going with the evaluation. And that again, is just to kind of get a general sense of the level of familiarity people have with doula services. Okay, next slide. So that's it for me. I just wanted to give a, a little overview of the evaluation we'll be doing and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Molly. And so uh, we brought Molly on board so that you guys um, know that as we're going through this process, uh, we may uh, have to call upon you as clinical supervisors, as home visitors, potential doulas, um, to support some of the understanding. Um, and so we wanted to kind of just foreshadow uh, the, the needs around evaluation of this project. I did see another question. Um, so I'll pause there to see if there's any questions to Molly directly in, uh, around the evaluation. Okay. And with none, I'm going to go back to the chat and try and answer a, 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 a question that we have here. So Jill asked, um, to be clear, 
does the OC uh, see programs integrating doula services into existing programs or offering these services as a separate program? So if you can hear how we've structured this program, we've kind of sort of modeled it off of uh, the Yukon Mind Over Mood pro program in that um, there's, there's a need for service, right? Um, there's a need to kind of onboard people who do that, provide that service into the world of of home visiting. So just like Jen Vendetti, take um, therapists uh, from the field um, and do a training with them to prepare them. And then they pair them with um, home uh, families. Uh, the, it's, it's a very similar idea, right? And so that was the basis of this uh, doula pilot program. And so the idea is that if there is a home visitor uh, that decides to become a doula, they will not be a doula for their own families. They'd have to be paired with a family, um, a, you know, in, maybe in the region um, to be able to support uh, their work. If um, when we when we share with you um, the flyer and the and the uh, literature that speaks about the touch. Um, Dula, uh, uh, Sayana and Cynthia could really talk to you guys about um, the level of touch of a doula, what we've prescribed in terms of the sessions prenatally, the session um, while, you know, supporting the birth and then the postnatal sessions there and uh, um, the best uh, middle ground in terms of what an experience is that the Office of Early Childhood could afford to pay for doulas. Um, I can't speak to, you know, individual doulas and the level of, you know, uh, attention that they may have to give to a family outside of what's prescribed and what's uh, offered as, as, as a service uh, for using doulas. Um, but it's going to be separate. Um, so the doulas will, you know, share information directly with UConn in terms of evaluation. The doulas will input um, uh, their information and data points into uh, a secure data system that Cyan maintains, and they won't be integrated into like ECIS at all. Um, the, so the home visiting family, uh, the home visiting staff will continue to do what they do as home visiting folk, um, putting things into ECIS as they normally serve a family. And then the doula will be a separate service that comes in to uh, support the family. And so there, I think there's beauty in definitely some shared um sessions if you know a home visitor is going in and a doula is going in because a home visitor wants to be there to support a family during um lactation consultant consult consultation then i think you know it it's it's possible as long as that's what the family wants but um it's the idea that the doula essentially has eight touches um included um it's five to eight i have to I have to think through the virtual is different than the in person um and so the the doula has those very prescribed um, uh, or set out uh, sessions with the family, whereas a home visitor is with a family for several years, several months. Um, and so, uh, you know, but Sayana told you, you, you know, she's still connected to that baby that she delivered 20 years ago. Um, and so I can't say that that won't be the case for, um, for these doulas. However, uh, the Office of Early Childhood can only pay for so many sessions with a doula, if that answers your question. So with that, um, this is, oh, there we go. So when we send out these PowerPoints, you'll be able to, um, to see uh, the, the contact information for Earth's Natural Touch, uh, the application process. Um, will will be uh, one that's going to be uh, prescribed and we'll share with you an email after this presentation give us um a, a couple days to pull together all those documents and we'll send a comprehensive email that has all of that stuff um, but we can send those slides prior to uh the application and referral email that goes out to you guys um so there we go any other questions guys and I think because of the timing, we are actually done a little early. Um, and so you may have 12 more minutes back into your world. And so I thank you guys for your participation um, 
in this session with us and I'm ex I'm as, as excited as you guys are are in the um in the chat and I have uh, Ashley is um our our lead in in this world of home visiting and she's online and so she has heard all of the concerns that are in the chat and we will regroup as a org as a as a team and get back to you guys with some of those formal questions being answered so I thank you guys um, happy Tuesday, and I think we'll see you guys in another couple of days for more training on Thursday morning. No, tomorrow morning, Jen. Benchmark oh. and resources. You're tomorrow? Tomorrow and Thursday, Jen. Stop oh. it. Yes. Oh, the fun continues, guys. All right, so <laughs> see you tomorrow morning, and then we'll see you on Thursday. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody. Have a good afternoon. Can Mary go right?